Tēnā koutou and welcome to today's webinar on elections brought to you by the Parliamentary Engagement Team. My name is Jessie Flannerine and I'm an Education Advisor at Parliament and your host for today. And joining me as our expert guests are Rachel Hayward from the, sorry, the Deputy Secretary of the Cabinet. Hello. Dr. John Wilson from the Parliamentary Library. Hello. And Erin Marsh from the Electoral Commission. Hello. Cool, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have any questions for our presenters, please write them in the chat box at any time throughout this webinar. If they are not answered right away, we'll address them in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. With any comments or questions, it would be great if you could switch to all panelists and attendees using the drop down arrow by the chat. That way they can be seen by everyone. Erin, perhaps you can give us a quick rundown as to why elections matter. Sure. Um, so elections are obviously at the heart of democracy. Um, if we didn't have elections, it wouldn't be a democracy. But in order to have a strong democracy, we need participation across the board um, from all age groups, all sectors of society. Um, if we have groups that aren't voting, which we, we already know we do, particularly youth, um, then those age groups then or those those demographics are not being represented in Parliament. Their voices are not being heard. They're not electing people that represent them. So Parliament ends up being focused more towards just one or however many particular groups and, and that other group will get ignored. Um, so I like to think of it in terms of that we don't generally allow other people to make decisions for us, like think about what clothes you wear or what's on your Spotify playlist. You know, that stuff that we like to make those choices for ourselves. Yet by not participating in elections, we're allowing other people to make the decisions for us on things that matter so much more that impact on our day to day life. Um, and we're actually extremely lucky in New Zealand that we have very free and fair elections. We have a very transparent government. Um, so I think it's really important that people understand just how privileged we are and actually participate and, and take part and make sure that, that they're being heard and that our parliament does represent New Zealand as a whole. Thank you, Erin. And just remember that you must be enrolled for your vote to count. And you can check this at the Vote NZ website. We'll, we'll share a link for that in the chat. Today, we'll be working our way through the election timeline that you can see here on your screen. This is an interactive timeline that is available on Parliament's website, and it showcases each event that will occur within the election period. So as with anything, there are rules around elections and some of which are set out in legislation. Why is it so important to have legislation around elections, John? Thanks, Jesse. Um, well, I think if we think of elections as a contest or game, then we need rules around the game to make them fair and transparent, uh, to ensure that everybody knows what the rules are, what the penalties are for breaking those rules, and also, importantly, what the process is to change the rules of the game. For example, it wouldn't be fair to change the rules around elections, such as the electoral system, just uh, before uh, an upcoming election, just to suit uh, the people in power. Uh, and in fact, some countries think that the rules around elections are so vital to democracy that they actually put them in their constitution, so they can't be changed easily. New Zealand doesn't have a, a codified constitution in that sense, uh, but we do make sure that we can't change things too easily, such as parts of the MMP electoral system, by stipulating that some of those uh, mechanisms in the Electoral Act 1993 can only be changed, uh, excuse me, by a 75% majority in parliament uh, or by referendum. And in fact, in 2011, you'll recall that we did have a referendum on the MMP system, just because we think that is a very important part of our democracy. Hmm. Thanks, John. Now, the announcement of the election date. Can the Prime Minister choose any date they like, John? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, as long as it's a Saturday. <laughs> um, uh, but more generally uh, speaking, New Zealand governments, governments prefer to run the full three-year term. Um, but having said that, as a Westminster system, uh, our, our government could, could fall if they lose a vote of no confidence or, or can't get the budget bills passed. So that could happen at any time through, through the three years. 
Uh, and in fact, an early election uh, could and has been called, for example, 2002, when we had the election in July, and that was outside the normal months of, of uh, October to November. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, the P Prime Minister is used to announce the date about midway through an election year, uh, but in more recent times, uh, since around uh, 2008 or so, and continued uh, by the current government, the tendency has been for the Prime Minister to, to announce the, the election day very early, early on in the year, around about January uh, or February. Hmm. Now, by-elections. Can you explain what a by-election is and why we need them? Sure. So by-elections are held for those MPs who hold an electorate seat. We have 72 electorate seats. Uh, well, we have 71 currently, but there'll be 72 for the 2020 election. Um, and for whatever reason, if an MP leaves Parliament before the ne ne next election, that creates a vacancy. Uh, and we have to have a by-election to fill that vacancy by voting for a new MP. So it's important to note that in a by-election, only the electorate vote is contested, and it's only the people in that electorate that vote for the uh, the candidates uh, for the vacancy. So, so no party vote uh, has been held, no party votes held in a by-election. Uh, in fact, there have been over 360 by-elections uh, held in New Zealand since uh, the very first was held in Nelson in 1854, and that was just one year after New Zealand's first parliamentary elections. Uh, but almost two-thirds of those 360 have been held before 1900. Uh, sometimes we don't hold a by-election in an election year, uh, and that uh, can occur when the vacancy is created within six months of a general election. Uh, but that's not enough. We still have to get the House to agree uh, by a 75% majority uh, that no writ be issued for a by-election. And in that case, if they all agree, we, we don't have a, a by-election so close to a general election. Uh, and since 1996, there have been at least five occasions when a by-election has not been held uh, because Parliament was due to expire within six months. Well, then that brings us nicely to valedictory statements. What exactly is a valedictory statement, John? Uh, valedictory statements are speeches given by those MPs who are not contesting the next election uh, or who might resign during a, a parliamentary term. Uh, and in that speech, the uh, MP might reflect on, on their own personal achievements, maybe their party's achievements, uh, they might talk about the direction of the country. Uh, they also try to be a little bit funny, talking about uh, life in Parliament. Uh, and of course, they pay thanks and tribute to their family, their friends, their staff, their colleagues, uh, and sometimes even their political opponents, uh, believe it or not. Um, they are normally limited to 15 minutes, uh, but the speaker does have discretion to alter that time uh, if it's a particularly significant uh, MP. And do these always happen before the election? Generally they do, um, but there are exceptions when, uh, for example, those who, who may have been re-elected at an election, but perhaps for what didn't uh, become part of, of the government and reflect on their future and decide to retire or resign, uh, so, for example, Bill English uh, was re-elected in the 2017 election, but decided to retire, uh, and so he gave a valedictory. Um, and then Peter Dunn is another example. He, he wasn't re-elected, he didn't stand, uh, and in a way he wasn't given a chance to make uh, a valedictory, uh, but uh, Victoria University graciously allowed him to make one at one of their conferences, which was held in the legislative chamber. So we've come to the regulated period of election expenses. Who regulates this, John? Generally speaking, it's the Electoral Commission. Uh, they also provide opinions on whether an advertisement uh, is an election advertisement. Uh, sometimes it goes further than that and, and reach, reaches the courts where, where the parties have different ideas about whether it was or wasn't. Uh, but most of the time, um, parties try and stick uh, well within the rules. And so where does the money for campaigns come from? 
The the campaigns, uh, the money money for political parties and, and, their, and their campaigns comes from, from two main sources, I would say. Uh, donations from the public, uh, donations from corporations, large businesses, uh, and donations from, from large benefactors. Um, the second main uh, source of funding, uh, especially in relation to advertising, is uh, via the taxpayer, via the, via the Electoral Commission. Uh, for example, in 2017, uh, over $4 million was given to parties to put up advertising on television, on radio, uh, and on social media. And what would happen if you spent too much on a campaign? Uh, well, there are limits uh, for, on the campaign. So candidates can spend, individual candidates can spend up to a maximum of 28200 and political parties can spend uh, over $1 million uh, on, on their campaigns. If uh, they exceeded those expenditure limits, uh, they are liable for prosecution uh, as a corrupt or, or illegal practice. Uh, and that can attract a uh, sentence of imprisonment uh, or monetary pe penalties, around, around about $40,000 uh, uh, in penalties. Because hmm. we've had a question come in asking, could you please outline if any measures have been put in place to ensure there's no external or international influence or interference in our election? Um, kind of given the recent trends and issues in the US in other democratic countries. Do you have an answer to that, John? Uh, there are some measures in place. We're, we're perhaps not as, as strict as some uh, countries overseas, but uh, generally speaking, uh, most donations over a, a certain threshold have to be uh, declared and, and the donor identified. Uh, and so there are very, there, there are some strict uh, rules around anonymous donations. And so that would prevent say, for example, uh, you know, some, some entity overseas uh, funding a, po a, po a political party without mm -hmm. the New Zealand public uh, being aware of it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that leads nicely into, is there a way for the public to find out how much has been spent? Yes, there is. Uh, as part of our election rules, uh, parties have to declare their election expenses to the Electoral Commission. And that's generally by April of the following year. So for, for this year, it'll be April 2021. Uh, and those details, uh, including spreadsheets of their expenses, uh, are available on the Commission's website. Mm -hmm. Erin, I think this might be a question for you. Is election misinformation slash social media advertising an issue in New Zealand? Does, do you get that through the Electoral Commission? Oh. Yeah, that would go through the legal and policy team. So unfortunately, I, I can't answer that one. <laughs> um, but questions like that, are they're really good questions. So if you would like those answered, if you can uh, send the question through on the contact us um, uh, section on vote.nz and someone from the commission will get back to you with an answer. Hmm. And we have another question. Beyond the start of the regulated period, what advertising is allowed, e.g., is only simple advertising permissible from the electorate office? And that's the end. So by simple, I'm not sure what you mean there, but as I guess, is there rules around the advertising, like how that can be done? John? Uh, do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are the, uh, outside the regulated period, uh, they normally have to declare um, how, how much they're spending uh, on 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 advertising. Um, I think I think they are allowed uh, to spend their own money basically on 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 advertising. I, I'm not too sure we would call it campaign advertising. Um, but it, it really depends on the source of those funds. So a lot of parties are, are funded for parliamentary purposes, uh, but they're not uh, funded for election purposes, mm. ap apart from that regulated period. Mm. Sorry, Alan has just clarified, simple as MPs contact details only. <laughs> so thanks, Alan. <laughs> 
Um, Rachel, we've just had a comment come in. Maybe, oh, thank you. <laughs> There's some water blasting going on in Rachel's office. So unfortunately, sorry if you guys could hear that. <laughs> now, Rachel, are there rules around what the government can and can't do or dis decide in the lead up to an election? Uh, and I do apologise for the noise. I think they're water blasting the roof of the beehive and we're up on the 10th floor here, so it's kind of close. I keep, they, they're moving across. Um, yeah, Jesse, there are. So, uh, and this is something that we find there is sometimes some confusion about. So the pre-election period in terms of government decisions and action is the three months before the election. So this year it starts on the 19th of June. Um, and we sometimes find that there's a bit of confusion in the media and uh, even among officials about what can and can't be done um, in New Zealand in the pre-election period. And I think that's probably because Australia and other countries have some different rules. So in Australia, for example, um, their government operates in caretaker mode from the time of the dissolution of parliament through until the election and, and until after that when the election results are clear. Uh, and that means that the government follows a series of practices aimed at ensuring that their actions don't bind an incoming government during the pre-election period. That's not the case in New Zealand. In New Zealand, we don't have a caretaker period before the election, we have one after. And so in New Zealand, the government has um, full power to govern right up until the election. Having said that, there are two areas, or two main areas in which the government voluntarily chooses to exercise some restraint in the pre-election period. One of those, sorry, I can hear my water blasting redoubling. One of those is around significant appointments. So if there's a high profile appointment coming up that's gonna start in the three months before the election, or it's a role that's strategically significant. Um, in those cases, the government will try to either carry a vacancy or perhaps make a short-term appointment of up to a year to carry that position through. And the other area of self-imposed restraint is that governments tend to try to avoid government advertising, because government advertising, not election advertising, uh, during that three months, if that, if that advertising might create the impression that public funds are being used for political party political purposes. Hmm, thank you. So Erin, working at the Electoral Commission, could you give us a bit of an overview about what this entails during the enrolment campaign period? Sure. Uh, so the enrolment update campaign is the time that we send out letters to all registered or enrolled electors. So everybody that has um, filled in an enrolment form and got themselves on the, the electoral roll, we send out those letters to give people an opportunity to update their details. So often people will move house and they'll forget to update their details because there's always so much going on. Um, so for people who have got maybe a mail redirection notice in or somebody is forwarding on their mail, um, it gives them that opportunity to update their address on that form and send it back. Uh, can also give people a chance to change their name, change their occupation. Um, and we also do it as a way to kind of clean up the electoral roll. So we get an idea of who who has moved and not told us by the letters that come back that have been sent that the people don't live there anymore. Um, and it's also usually the time that we start our really big community engagement push because it's, it's a really easy way, easy time to... Um, have that conversation with people about whether they're enrolled because if they haven't received a letter then we know that they're not enrolled and so we can help them fill in an enrollment form. Um, obviously this year with the COVID-19 environment things are a little bit different so a lot of our face-to-face -face engagement just can't happen for uh, safety reasons this year. So we will still be doing a lot of um, community engagement, and, but it's going to be a lot more digitally focused. So obviously that's going to make it a little bit harder for us to get in with some of our hard to reach communities. So if anybody who's watching this um, has got some community groups or some networks within the community that you would like to have us engage with, you can go on to vote.nz and bring up the contact details for your local registrar of electors and I know they would love to hear from you and have a conversation about ways that um, we could work together to get out there and address people's questions and just motivate them and encourage them to participate in the elections. Great, we've just got a question. When does the enrolment period generally end prior to the election date? Oh, that is a fantastic question. So, uh, in the past, it has always been that you could enrol up until the day before election day, but this year you can now enrol on election day as well. Um, and we will be talking a little bit further on about some of the cutoffs around the enrolment. Great. 
And we've got another question here. Are there any sections of society that do not enroll? And do you have extra focus in these areas? What is the mix of women and men who vote? That's another brilliant question. Um, yes, there, there are areas of society that we know don't enroll and don't vote. Uh, youth being a big part of that. And again, I've got a, got a slide shortly where I'll be uh, talking about the, the actual numbers around that. Um, we do have sort of four target groups that we put a lot of work into within the Commission, and that is youth, Māori, Pacifica, and the culturally and linguistically diverse community. So like our new New Zealanders and people who maybe come from a, a background of not, not growing up um, with a democracy. Um, so yes, we do put extra money and extra work into that, um, just because we do know from, from our stats that they are the ones that don't participate. But we do put a lot of effort into trying to engage with anybody, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, as to the breakdown of men and women, uh, that I actually don't have any stats on at the moment, sorry. That leads us nicely to our next slide, which gives as a bit of an overview of the overall turnout and voting from the enrolments. Could you explain a wee bit more, Erin? I could. Um, so I'll start with the enrolment rates. So at the moment, our enrolment rates are sitting at 89% across the country. Obviously that differs a little bit from area to area, um, but the overall is at 89%. Um, but the, the area that kind of concerns us a little bit is around youth enrollment, and that is the 18 to 24 year old age bracket. And at the moment, that enrollment rate is only sitting on 59%. So that's a lot of young people out there who are giving up their opportunity to have their voices heard. Um, in terms of voter turnout, uh, the overall voter turnout in 2017 was 79% across the board. And you can see from this graph that we've, we can break it down by age group. So you can see that the older people get, the higher the turnout rates are. So if you look at the youth one, you can see that the, the 18 to 29 is quite, quite a lot lower. But where this image is actually a little bit misleading is that these numbers are done off the amount of people enrolled, not the amount of people that are eligible to vote. So when you take, in, take that into account, the voter turnout rate for the 18 to 24 year old age group actually drops down to just under 50%, which is, is really low. So we really want to get more young people voting and making sure that, that our parliament does reflect all age groups across society and, and not just the, the older generations. Yeah, a couple of comments there, if I could, Darren. Um, yeah, there's almost a million people that didn't vote in the 2017 election. Uh, over a quarter of a million of those were not enrolled, but uh, around two thirds or over, actually uh, well over two thirds were, were enrolled, but did, did not turn out to vote. So that's, uh, you know, a million, they talk about the missing million, but uh, that, yeah. and that's where, where, that's where they, they come from. And, and just to further, one, one further comment on, on, on the youth thing, if, if we define young people as, as under 40, uh, there are almost a quarter of a million people who, who, who were enrolled but did not vote. And of those, 85% were under 40. Yeah. So that's, uh, that just gives you an indication of, of that uh, gap between older voters and, and younger voters. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons that we are quite concerned about the um, drop or the, the low rates of youth voter turnout is that um, a lot of studies have shown that someone's voting behaviour in the first two elections that they're eligible to vote in will shape their behaviour for the rest of their lives. So mm. young people who don't vote are less likely to vote as they, as they are age. Um, which means that we run the risk of our voter turnout continuing to drop. But the good news there is, as you can see from the graph, we did have a 6.5% increase in the amount of 18 to 24 year olds voting in 2017, which was really exciting. So we're hoping that we might, might see some similar results this year. Thank you. Now, on to the adjournment of Parliament which is the last day that Parliament can meet before the election. So what happens on this day, John? Uh, on, on the adjournment day, it's, it's, it's the last sitting day. So I, I guess it's the last uh, formal day for MPs to, to meet in Parliament. Um, and generally speaking, there's a, there's a, there's a period of a, a few days, sometimes up to a week before the last sitting day or adjournment day and the end dissolution day, which we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a minute. Uh, and so over that time, there's a number of parliamentary processes that uh, might need to be completed, uh, such as obtaining royal 
assent to bills passed, uh, maybe printing select committee reports for presentation. Uh, and we still, the written questions may be lodged uh, and papers such as any reports for government departments. They may also be presented after the House is adjourned, but before the House is dissolved. Hmm. So then what is the difference between the adjournment and the dissolution, John? I guess uh, an adjournment, adjournment doesn't necessarily trigger any other events, but a dissol the dissolution of Parliament does trigger uh, a number of events. So it sets in train uh, really a, a, a series of key dates that lead to the general election. For example, the Governor General within seven days issues a writ to the Electoral Commission to make all necessary arrangements for the conduct of a general election. Um, and it also normally specifies nomination day that, you know, the nomination of candidates uh, for, for the general election. Uh, and it also obviously sets out the, uh, the date of the election, uh, which has to be a Saturday. Hmm. And what happens after the dissolution of parliament then, Rachel, because who's running the country? How do you see, speaking of running, I've run around the corridor to see if it's any better around another part of the cabinet office, and it is not. But on the <laughs> outside, you're getting a full tour of the cabinet office. Um, <laughs> so just before we leave that dissolution photo, I really like that photo because you can see there, I don't think that people always know that um, it's the Governor General who dissolves Parliament on the advice of the Prime Minister. And in that photo, she does it by proclamation, but the proclamation is read out usually by uh, New Zealand's Herald Extraordinary, who you can see in the centre of that photo with his red sash on standing alongside the parliamentary co-marker. Um, after dissolution, the, the government still has full power to govern, as I said earlier. There's no caretaker convention here before the election, but I guess the difference is because the House isn't sitting, uh, Parliament can't pass any legislation, so the government can't get any new laws through. Um, but ministers still meet for cabinet and they le lead up to the election. Uh, and as John says, it's dissolution that then kicks off the, the chain of events for um, the uh, issuing of the writ in the election. The, there's a long-standing practice in New Zealand too that at the time, the proclamation for summonsing the next parliament um, is issued at this stage as well because you know there must always be that continuity of parliament. So again, that's the Governor General who, who issues that proclamation. Hmm. And we've just got a question come through. What happens to unfinished business such as law changes or budgetary promises? Can the new parliament choose to simply drop these? John, perhaps you can. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm probably Rachel's better place, but I, as, as far as I can recall, um, legislation that hasn't passed through the House sort of lapses. Uh, in terms of the budget, that's normally is passed before an election year. Uh, so, you know, departments funding can, can continue. Uh, and when the new parliament uh, is, is in place, they can often reinstate items from, from the last parliament uh, to continue with. Uh, sometimes if it's a new, completely new government, uh, they might uh, choose to not uh, reinstate some items of business uh, and, and, and uh, get going on their own agenda. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there, Rachel? No, I thought that was perfect, John. Oh, good. <laughs> well, then, John, can you give us a quick explanation about the pre-election economic and fiscal update? Yes, well, as my colleagues and my other subject team say, they, they call it the PREFU. Um, and uh, it generally happens about 20 to 30 days before a general election, where the New Zealand Treasury uh, provide some context uh, about the economy and, and the government's finances. Um, what sort of things, you know, the economy can expect in the future, what sort of risks they might face over the next few years. Uh, and so that gives an indication, not just to voters, but also to the MPs and, and perhaps political parties uh, about the fiscal situation. And it might inform their campaign promises. Is it affordable to promise this and that, uh, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really an important um, piece of legislation that uh, helps to inform uh, decision making uh, going forward. Now, writ day, this is an important day, but what on earth is a writ, John? <laughs> 
Well, as the slide says, it's simply a written instruction uh, or a formal direction to, to the Electoral Commission to hold the uh, election. Um, and it's actually, the form of the writ is actually set out in the 1993 Electoral Act. Uh, and it sort of begins like this. To the Electoral Commission, pursuant to section 125 of the Electoral Act 1993, I authorize and require the Electoral Commission to make all necessary arrangements for the conduct of a general election. Uh, and then it proceeds to specify what day uh, nomination day is, uh, what, po what polling day is, i.e. the election date. It's a Saturday, but we still have to decide on the date and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a formal instruction that sort of lays out uh, the timetable going forward. You see, the other thing about the writ that you can see with Dame Patsy there is um, it's actually huge in this kind of digital age. You know, the writ is physically a really big piece of um, parchment, the, the parchment that we call goatskin, that I think probably did used to be goatskin, John, but there's no actual goat in it anymore. But um, it does still have a goat watermark if you hold it up to the light. You can still see this watermark. And so it's an A3 piece of parchment. Um, and that's because the Electoral Commission actually endorses the back of it with the names of all the constituent uh, candidates who are returned after the election and, and that is that, that writ is then physically returned to the clerk of the house so that's when you hear people talk about the return of the writ that's what that is. Well we just had a question come through about the Governor-General actually asking is the Governor-General a ceremonial role? Rachel you could probably answer this best. <laughs> It's the sort of question I love. Um, yes, the, the, there are lots of parts to the Governor General's role and there is a very important ceremonial role, but um, it's a great question because this time around the election is when you see the Governor General playing her constitutional role. She has a really significant constitutional role. And as we go through um, this webinar, I think the Governor General is a bit of a thread through the whole thing. So she issues the writ, that's what kicks the election off. She's the one who dissolves parliament and, when, and she has a role that we'll come to in the formation of the government. And then when we get to the opening of parliament, you know, she's a central figure there too. So a really good question. This is the time when you see the governor general at their most constitutional. Mm. Thank you, Rachel. Now, the 16th of August is also an important date for the electoral roll, isn't it, Erin? How so? That is correct. Um, so, writ day, the 16th of August, is the last day that people can enrol in order to have their names in the printed roll. Um, so, just in case there are people out there that don't know, um, New Zealand is broken up into electorates, and you can see here there are 65 general electorates, 7 Māori electorates. Um, an electorate is basically just a, a physical area, like almost like a big neighbourhood. Um, and so, every electorate has its own printed role and that is the list of names um, names and addresses of everybody that is enrolled within that electorate so the uh, there are two forms of the the printed role there is just the the regular one which is available for the public to view so you can view that at libraries um, at the uh, and at registrars offices around the country um, but we also use the printed role on voting day or at voting places. So you go in and you get your name marked off the, the roll so that we know that you've voted and we can make sure you don't vote more than once. Um, and then you get given your voting papers and it, that's what makes it nice and quick and easy. Um, so as I said earlier, you can still enroll after the 16th of August, but if you enroll by the 16th of August, it makes it much faster and quicker in the voting place. And I'll explain a little bit more about that um, a little bit later when we talk about special votes. Um, but by being enrolled by the 16th of August, it also means that you will get your easy vote card sent out to you, which is a pack that comes out a few weeks before the election. It's got a little credit card sized card that you can take into the voting place, hand it over to the officials in there, and it's got your name and the page and line number that your name is on, so they can find you really quickly in the roll, get you crossed off, hand you your papers, and you can be in and out of the voting place in no time at all. Um, so. And the voting pack, the, the Easy Vote pack, also has information about the local candidates and about where you can find your voting places and the hours that they're open. So um, it's actually a really, really good thing to have. So we strongly encourage people to be enrolled by the 16th of August. It just makes things so much easier for everybody. Thanks, Erin. Now, nomination day. So who can be nominated and how do parties decide who to nominate, John? 
Uh, political parties uh, depends on on what sort of uh, candidate uh, you're talking about. Uh, if it's an electorate MP, it's it's generally might be delegated down to the branch or electorate level. So they they have uh, local contests for for local MPs, if you like. Uh, and at the national level, um, especially for list MPs, and perhaps for for, for the ranking of list MPs. Uh, it's generally left to the the uh, the party organisation at, at the at the national level. Great. And is there any cost for nomination? There is. Uh, it seems to be about three hundred dollars, which has to be paid uh, no later than noon on nomination day. Hmm. And is there any rules to prevent someone to for from running as an MP? Yes, there are. The Electoral Act uh, sets out a number of um, people who can't uh, stand for Parliament. Uh, that includes New Zealand citizens who have been outside New Zealand uh, for over three years, uh, and permanent residents who haven't been in, in the country for the last 12 months, um, and people detained in hospital under the Mental Health uh, Act 1992, uh, and also um, a person who has been detained in prison, pursuant to the sentence of imprisonment uh, 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 after the commencement of the electoral disqualification of a sentence prisoners, Amendment Act 2010. Mm. So there's a, there's a number of exclusions there for our MPs. Mm. Well now, overseas voting. Can any Kiwi vote from overseas, Erin? Um, yeah, there are a few rules. Um, so if you are a New Zealand citizen, you have to have been back into the country within the last three years. And if you're a permanent resident, it has to have been within the last 12 months. Um, now, there is no time limit or, or minimum time that you have to have been in the country for that to start. You can just basically fly into Auckland Airport, get off the plane, get back on the plane and off you go. And your three years has reset. So you don't have to have been back for months or anything. Just, just any visit will do. Hmm. And what electorate would someone overseas vote in? So overseas voters are enrolled in the electorate in which they last lived for at least one month before they live uh, before they left New Zealand. So the address that they last lived at. Um, if you've been overseas for 20 or 30 years, it doesn't matter if it's your childhood home, um, if the house has even been destroyed, we, we still can, can get people enrolled at that last address that they were at. Hmm. So then it's probably good to go into some stats here. How many Kiwis vote from overseas, Erin? Well, in 2017, we received over 60,000 um, overseas votes, which is almost twice, about two electorates, almost. Um, we were expecting that to increase this year. Not, not sure if, if that will happen, but we're prepared just in case. Um, and as you can see from this image, there are a few options for people sending back voting places. Uh, sorry, voting papers. Um, so the upload is the most, most popular. So that's when people send it through a secure digital network and basically email it um, back to the Electoral Commission. Um, you can go into an overseas voting place, um, just, just like a, a normal voting place here. Uh, as to whether that will happen, that will depend on the COVID-19 environments at the time. Um, but the overseas voting place that always jumps to mind for me is New Zealand House in London. So you can just walk in and cast your vote as normal. And there's also postal and fax, but they are becoming very, very less favoured because they are, I mean, fax is an outdated technology and the postal service is just very, very slow coming from some countries. So, so by posting forms back, you run the risk of it not arriving in time. Mm, we've had a good question here saying, if you vote in person, is it possible to vote online and end up voting twice? Um, well, the only way to sort of vote online is from overseas, and that's not, not technically voting online. So we don't have online voting in New Zealand. Um, one of the reasons that we tick people off the electoral roll is because all of those rolls get scanned afterwards. And so we very quickly find out when someone has been ticked off in more than one place. And when those upload, voter, upload papers come through to the overseas team, they're, they're all checked. So no, it's, it is not possible to vote twice by doing it in person and online. It's a great oh. question though. Mm. <laughs> so how long would these votes, these overseas votes take to count? Um, well, once, they, once they've been brought back, uh, they, they all go in with the special votes. So they get count, counted in that normal period after the election with everything else. Hmm. 
So then advanced voting, when was advanced voting introduced? Um, so advanced voting has been around for quite a long time, but you used to have to have a specific reason for voting in advance. Um, so it, it wasn't really an option for most people. But as time's gone on and you know times change, people aren't as available on Saturdays as they used to be. So advanced voting kind of became a, a bit of a big thing in 2011. Um, got quite big in 2014, but then exploded in 2017 because that was the year that we introduced enrol and vote at the same time. So we had staff in the voting places that could help people enrol and we had enrollment forms available. Whereas prior to that, people had to be enrolled before they went in. Um, so yeah, we just made it that little bit easier in, mm. in people's busy lives. <laughs> How many Kiwis can vote in advance? Um, well, anyone, anyone can vote in advance. In 2017, about 40% of votes were cast in advance. We're expecting at least 60% will do it in advance this time. Um, so, and in response to that, we've it, extended the amount of voting places that we're going to have set up. I thought it was going to be around 800, but I've, I've since been corrected that that's, that's going to include mobile voting. So we're looking at around seven to 750 advanced voting places. Uh, they're still yet to be confirmed. The returning officers are still working very hard identifying and securing those locations. Um, but one of the reasons that we are trying to get more voting places is just to make it a little bit easier to do the social distancing with this COVID-19 environment. Um, so the voting places will still look much the same as they always have, except there'll just be a little bit more social distancing within the lines and you'll be asked to do hand sanitizer. And we are, we are trying to get bigger voting places just to make that a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've also extended the advanced voting period. Normally it would have started on the 7th, but we're starting on the 5th. And we're also going to have all the advanced voting places open the weekend before the election, which we wouldn't normally do, just to, to create more options for people to vote so that we can try and cut down on crowds. Okay, we've had a question come in. Is it an offence to vote more than once? I'm yes, thinking yes of it, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, it is. And, and there is a team within the Electoral Commission that um, goes through and looks at any potential dual votes. Um, they get investigated and if, if it is deemed that it has been a deliberate dual vote, then it gets um, forwarded onto the police. Another question is, if a student is studying in another part of the country from where they live, which electorate should they vote in? Oh, I was hoping someone was going to ask this question. So that's, that's a really good question. And students actually have a little bit of a different rule around where they need to be enrolled compared to most people. So students have the choice of being enrolled either where they consider home or where they are studying. Um, it depends on which area they kind of feel that a little bit more of a connection to. So for some students, they'll want to stay enrolled at home because they're only studying in the place that they are because it's the only place that offers their course rather than somewhere that they have a connection to or plan to stay. Um, so it is entirely up to the student which one they want to do. It's then just a matter of um, if, you, if you are enrolled where you're at home, but you're where you are studying on election day, then you'll need to cast a special vote. Hmm. If I could add, it's that choice is also available to MPs. Yes, and people who travel a lot for a living. Great. I just want to say that the questions I've missed, we will address at the end. But another one we have here is, if anyone can vote in advance, do we still need a specific day? Ooh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I suppose that that's probably a good question for you, John, because that would be in the legislation <laughs> around needing a, a specific voting day. Yes, well, well that's right. Yeah, so the Saturday a Saturday is specified in in in, in the legislation, and there are you know with the writ uh, the, the, there's a whole timetable uh, that is set off there. Um, I guess it's more of a ph philosophical question. Um, maybe not, but on on the other hand, a, a a specific day sort of means that that's the last day people can vote. Uh, so if we didn't have a day, uh, we would might have to have a, a final day anyway when, when people can vote. Mm. Well, this year you're introducing po postal voting, right, Erin? 
Can you explain this a little bit more for us? Yes, we are. So um, it turns out that postal voting has actually been available for a while, but only for very specific groups. So this year, um, in response to COVID-19, we're extending the postal voting to allow for people who are high risk or who are unwell to uh, register in advance to be able to get that postal vote. So more information will be going up on the Commission's website um, in a few weeks around what that's going to look like, but people will need to register, it for, register for it in advance, so you will need to be correctly enrolled by that point. Then voting papers will be posted out and then people can fill them in at home and then they have the choice of posting them back in the mail or nominating someone to deliver them to an, a voting place on their behalf. Great, and thank you everyone for all your questions. I am just aware of the time, so we're just gonna move on from the voting and on to the regulated period ends. John, what does this mean? Uh, I'm not too sure I'm, uh, I can add too much more uh, here. Uh, maybe Rachel would want to say something. Uh, I mean, it's basically the idea that on election day, people should be free uh, of any undue influence. So uh, we don't want any advertising on, on the actual day itself. Uh, Rachel, did you have any further comments there? I think you've captured it in the slide, Jesse. Mm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, on to the big day, election day. So, New Zealand uses MMP as our voting system. How does this work? So, under MMP, we elect 120 MPs to Parliament. Of those 72 uh, this year will be elected by just the voters in individual electorates around the country, uh, and 48 MPs will be elected from political party lists. And so they're elected by all voters in New Zealand, really. Um, and so it's a proportional system, which means that, roughly speaking, the proportion of votes a political party gets largely reflects the number of seats it has in parliament. So party gets 30% of, of the party vote, uh, it's entitled to 30% uh, of the seats in parliament. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we have a party vote and, and an electorate vote. I, I, I would, I, there used to be that the Electoral Commission emphasised the party vote. Uh, I mean, my view is that the party vote is still the most important, uh, but there's been some changes in terms of uh, voter education over the years, and I'm not too sure we, we, we say that anymore, but um, it's, it's really the, where we start in terms of translating seats into, uh, votes into seats. Uh, because that, that, the party vote really tells each party how many seats they're entitled to uh, overall. Oh, cool. And so then what happens in a voting place, Erin? Okay, so when you first walk into a voting place, uh, particularly if it's a big voting place, you will get greeted by someone who is there to help you out. So there will be a couple of lines for you to choose from. So there will be a line for the general role and a line for the Māori role. Um, and so you, you go in, you choose the line that you want. If you've got your easy vote card, then it's, it's nice and simple and you just go up, like I said earlier, you get your papers. Um, you then get directed to go behind a voting screen. Um, so normally you go alone to vote so that you can't be unduly influenced, but you can take a support person with you if you would like to, um, if you have um, a, a need for a support person. Um, so then you have your, your papers, so for this particular election, once you've been ticked off the, the electoral roll or you've filled in your special vote papers, then you will get given your um, general election paper, which you get to put two ticks on, as John mentioned, with the party vote and the electorate vote, and you'll also be given your referendum papers. So you go behind the screen, you make your marks on those, you fold the papers in half and you put them, put them in the box. Um, you normally get an I have voted sticker on your way out. I'm not sure if those will be happening this year. Um, and then, yeah, bit of hand sanitizer and off you go. So it is very easy, particularly if you have enrolled before the 16th of August. Oh, well then how does the counting process work? So all of the votes that have been taken during the advanced voting period will get voted on election day between that nine to seven. So that's called the early count and uh, that gets done in the electorate headquarters. Then the votes that are taken in the polling places, once the polling place is closed after 7pm, those votes are counted there, right there in that voting place. 
uh, once they've all been counted, that number then gets called through to the electorate headquarters and the electorate headquarters then passes that on to the electoral commission and the electoral commission makes those, those numbers available um, right away to the public and to the media. So that's how you get those, um, those ongoing totals that you see um, on, the tele on the TV and things. Mm. Uh, but the, ref the referendum count votes won't be counted <laughs> until <Whoa. afterwards. laughs> this year we have two referendums yes. <laughs> so john what are what is a referendum um i, I would describe a referendum as a, as a mechanism mechanism of of direct democracy um if we think about it uh, when we go to a general election, we're not making a decision on, on matters of public policy directly. We're, we're electing the decision makers. But in a referendum, we are deciding on a matter of public policy. So we don't leave it to the MPs. We, we've, uh, we've got two referenda and it's up to the people to decide on, on, on that public policy matter. Uh, and so there can be citizens initiated referenda or, or government initiated referenda. And, and the two we have in this year's election are both government initiated referenda. Hmm. Now, the formation of the government. Rachel, can you give us a quick explanation about this? Oh, Rachel, you're on mute. <laughs> I can, Jesse, and I'm sorry, my water blasters were right over here, but they've moved briefly, so it's good timing. Um, so the Governor-General has an important role to play in government formation. Uh, she, before she can appoint a government, she has to determine where the confidence of the House lies. So under MMP, it's likely that after an election, you're going to have two or more parties who need to negotiate um, coalition or support agreements so that a government can be formed. And they're, they're looking to try and be able to command the support of the majority in the House of Representatives. So basically get more than half the votes in the House. And the Governor General is not involved in the negotiations. That's a political player's process. Um, but it's her role to determine where, who can command that majority. So after the uh, preliminary election night results, the parties start their negotiations. And um, in terms of their role, Governors General have talked about what they're looking for as being quantity and clarity. So the quantity is the formation of government depends on one or more parties being able to show they've got more than half the votes in the House. Um, and the clarity is that they can express the fact that they've got that quantity in clear and public statements. So it's not enough for a group of parties to have come to an agreement among themselves. Uh, they have to communicate the result of that of the negotiations publicly and unambiguously. And that might be um, orally or in written agreements, but it has to be clear and unambiguous. Dame Patsy gave a speech in March this year, uh, actually to the electoral officers, I think, in which she describes how this played out after the 2017 election. So it's worth having a look at that. It's on her website. I think there might be a, a reference popping up to it there. Yes, it is. So just a couple of things to be aware of in New Zealand. There's no tradition here that the leader of the party who gets the largest share of seats in the election gets the first crack at forming a government. Um, and as we saw in 2017, it may not be the leader of the party who got the most votes, who got the largest share of the seats, who ends up being appointed as prime minister, because the key is to be able to secure the support of more than half the elected members in the House, and that might be by a, a, a coalition or a support party agreement or both. How long those negotiations take, it can be two to five or six weeks, but the parties are likely to be under political pressure to produce an agreement um, or a result from the negotiations relatively quickly. And then once the government formation process is complete, the new government is appointed by the Governor General at a ceremony at Government House within just a few days of the, of the completion of, those, um, of that government formation process. Mm. Now you've mentioned the caretaker period a few times, Rachel. So who is governing the country between these negotiations that are going on between parties? Yes, so having said there is no caretaker period before the election, after the election is when it kicks in in New Zealand. And so it, it's the incumbent government, the government that was in power at the time of the election, they continue throughout the government formation period, but acting under the caretaker convention. And that means, um, well, there's two arms to it. One is during all those negotiations when it's not clear who will form the next government, that the usual day-to-day -day business of government continues. But if there's any significant matter that comes up, a big policy decision or a decision that would have long-term implications, that should be handled according to the caretaker convention 
and recognition of the fact that it's not clear who is actually going to be in government in a, in a short time. So it might be that decision is deferred or there's a short-term arrangement put in place. Um, or if neither of those is possible and it's something really significant, then those decisions should only be made in consultation with the other political parties. And then the second arm of the caretaker convention is once the parties have reached an agreement, uh, there's a short period before a new government's appointed. And at that time, the incumbent government should only act on the advice of the incoming government. Thank you, Rachel. Now, the official results. So Erin, you've spoken a bit about special votes. So what exactly are these? Okay, so special votes are votes cast by people who, for whatever reason, don't have their names in that printed roll. So it could be people that enrolled after the 16th of August. Uh, it could be people who are on the unpublished roll um, and includes all the overseas votes. So when you cast a special vote, because they can't tick you off in the book, you need to fill in another um, sheet of paper with your contact detail, your, your name, your date of birth, your address. And then after the election, those are checked against our records. And that's how we, how we know whether or not those votes are valid, whether we can actually include them in the count, because we can see from that whether those people um, were correctly enrolled, whether they voted in the right, right electorate. Um, and so all of that has to be done before those votes can be counted. Hmm. So then are there usually any changes once the votes have come in, John? Yes, there are, Jesse. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the specials mean uh, affect two or three parties uh, with what perhaps one party losing a seat or two and one or two parties gaining a seat. Uh, so in 2017, I think National lost uh, a seat and, and both Labour and the Greens gained a seat. Uh, in 1999, though, it was quite exceptional. Uh, five parties were affected and 14 seats uh, were affected. So on election night 1999, the Green Party had no seats in Parliament at all. And after specials, they had seven seats, including one electorate seat. So uh, you can see just how significant the special votes can be. Mm. And so can the results be challenged? Uh, yes, they can. For a limited time after the election, candidates can apply to a district court judge for, for a recount of the electorate vote. Uh, and party secretaries can apply for a recount of the party vote. Hmm. Great. And then on to the openings of Parliament. So you can see we have two openings here. What's the difference between them, Rachel? Uh, yes, you've got two openings, and in the middle, in the gap between them, um, you've got the uh, confirmation of the Speaker as well. So there are two openings of Parliament, the, the Commission opening. Um, I guess the thing to understand is, again, the Governor-General runs as a thread through these as well. So the Queen, or in our case, her representative, the Governor-General, never enters the debating chamber of the House. Um, that's strictly the territory of the MPs. And so the commission in the um, description of the commission opening, the, co the commission comes from the fact that her royal commissioners come on her behalf. So the commission opening is where uh, parliament is formally opened, MPs are sworn in and they elect a speaker. So the governor general um, asks her royal commissioners to come across and uh, they are the chief justice of New Zealand and two other senior judges. Um, and they come across to parliament and read the proclamation summoning parliament to meet. Uh, they tell the House when the Governor-General will attend to read the speech from the throne, and then they tell the House that the Governor-General wishes it to elect the Speaker. And so the Commissioners then withdraw, uh, the MPs are sworn in by the Clerk of the House, and then they elect a Speaker. And then once the Speaker is elected, the House is adjourned so that the Speaker can go up to Government House and be confirmed by the Governor-General. And during that confirmation, um, the Speaker lays claim to the rights and privileges of the House, especially uh, the right to freedom of speech, in debate to free access to the Governor General whenever the occasion may require and uh, to the most favourable construction being put on all proceedings. And so the Governor General formally agrees to this. And then um, on another day, uh, uh, certainly last time it was the next day, um, is the State Opening of Parliament. So that's actually the second day of the new Parliament. And it's the occasion on which the Governor General delivers what's known as the Speech from the Throne. Um, these are both, I think these are all live streamed uh, by Parliament, Jesse. And so, I mean, they're really worth watching because they're, particularly the state opening has a lot of kind of pomp and ceremony. A again, the reading of the speech from the throne doesn't actually take place in the debating chamber because of that principle that the Governor-General um, never enters the chamber. 
So instead, on her behalf, the ceremonial official, who's known as uh, the Usher of the Black Rod, goes and knocks on the door to the chamber three times and um, is initially barred from entry and then is only allowed in when the, when the speaker commands it. And, and those rituals um, all symbolise the House's independence from the executive. Um, Black Rod informs the House that the Governor-General desires it to attend, and so then the Speaker and the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and all the MPs proceed through to the Council Chamber where the Governor-General delivers the speech from the throne. And that speech is um, the Crown's explanation to MPs of the reasons for their being called together in Parliament at that time. So it's basically an announcement of the Government's legislative and policy programme for its time in office. And the Governor-General then presents a copy of that speech to the Speaker. Um, all the members return to the Chamber and the, uh, the speech is formally reported to the House by the end table. Great, thank you Rachel. And so after state opening, is it back to business as usual, John? Uh, yeah, yes and no, not, not, not immediately, but, uh, but you know, they, they've still got a few processes to go in terms of uh, deciding memberships on select committees uh, and that sort of thing. So select committee system doesn't get up and running uh, straight away. Uh, and then, of course, they have to uh, introduce their legislative program uh, and that can take a, a wee while to sort out as well. Uh, whether or not they're going to carry over business from, from the previous parliament. Uh, so technically it's open for business as usual, but business as usual uh, in practical terms doesn't necessarily start uh, start in the same week. Mm. Great, thank you. Well, that brings us to a Q&A session. Now I'm aware we've run a little bit over time, but we've had some really great questions come through. But to everyone that has to drop off now, thank you for attending. Um, so first up, we have a question. On election day, all political branding must be removed as to not influence voters. Does this include signage on electoral offices and MPs' cars? Um, I'm not the expert on this, but uh, I, I certainly think it, it's been an issue uh, when we've, the Electoral Commission submitted their reports to Parliament. Uh, I think cars are actually excluded and possibly electorate officers as well. Um, having said that, I don't think you're allowed to sort of park your your party vehicle outside a polling booth uh, with a signage on it. Um, but obviously you, you don't have to go down to the panel beater and, and get it resprayed just for a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and you're definitely not allowed to wear your, your party branded apparel into a mm. voting place. Mm. So when can a candidate slash party actively start their campaigns and then when must the campaign end? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, guess it, I guess it's a regulated period uh, in a way uh, because that uh, is the period over which um, spending on advertising uh, and promotions uh, begins for political parties and candidates. Uh, so I, I would say the, the, the start of the regulated period. Mm, okay. And can you be an MP but not a part of a party? Yes, you can. Um, well, uh, strictly speaking, you're, you're a candidate, I suppose, um, to, to, to get into parliament. You don't have to uh, have a party to do that. You can just stand as an independent in, in an electorate and hope to get elected. Um, but also, I guess we have an example uh, at the moment with uh, Jamie Lee Ross, who is an, an independent. He's not affiliated with any political party, and he's going to contest the botany electorate, which is the electorate he currently holds. Hmm. Now, Erin, this is a question for you. Have the electoral, electoral returning officers been appointed yet? Do you know? Yes, yes, they have. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah they, they were brought on um, earlier in the year. Um, early March, I believe. So yeah, so they're frantically working at the moment, uh, identifying and getting all of those voting places and making stuff ready. Oh, great, thank you. Now, is there anything happening in the digital voting space, Erin? Um, so late last year, we introduced digital enrollment 
so you can now completely update your details or enrol for the first time online. But in terms of um, online voting, is um, please correct me in the in the chat if if that's not quite what your question meant. But uh, no, there is there is no online voting um, mm -hmm. in the in the works or coming anytime soon. Mm. How can there be a date for hoardings to be down when, adva when in advance voting they can be influenced? Yeah, and that's that's a question that gets that gets asked a lot. Um, I don't have an answer to it, but I know it is something that the electoral commission has has thought about. Mm, okay, John, would you have any? Uh, no, just any just that. It's um, I, I think the electoral commission report to Parliament uh, has mentioned this issue. It's sort of a, a bit of a double standard in a way. Uh, and also the Parliament's own select committee uh, on, on the election has also raised it. Uh, I don't know how it can be um, overcome. Uh, I guess uh, I guess if you make an advanced vote, you just have to be <laughs> careful that you're not unduly swayed by anything, uh, uh, you know, until... Yeah, and there, there are rules Enough about how close to an advanced voting place campaigners and advertising can be. That's true, that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, Erin, this is another question for you, more on local <laughs> elections, though. Is mm -hmm. there a drive slash work being done for the Electoral Commission to oversee the Registrar for Council slash Regional Council DHB boards elections? Critical um, I, of, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, carry on with the rest of the question. <laughs> Um, it's critical of private providers being contracted to do this and not the Electoral Commission. Messaging yeah. around voter education wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I saw all those news articles where um, people were talking about um, there being a bit of a push for it to go back to the Commission. I don't know where that's actually sitting at the moment. Um, so that's maybe something to ask me again next year. <laughs> because all obviously all of our, our efforts at an election year go into the election so I don't know if there's been I don't know how much thought there's been put into it or mm -hmm. who would even make that decision to be honest. Okay now do they double check the count if it's a close result and like how close would the result have to be? Hmm. Well all the the votes that were counted on election night are all recounted as part of the official vote and yes uh don't quote me on this because it's not actually my area of expertise, but I do believe that if, if a vote is very close, that it will get recounted. Hmm. And of course, if, if, if the party vote was, was quite close, it's probable that a political party would ask for a recount uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. What do the scrutineers at polling place, what are the scrutineers at polling places meant to do? Uh, so their role is to basically uh, keep everything honest. So each party can send in a scrutineer and yeah, their role is to just sit there and make sure that the rules are being followed, that people aren't being unduly influenced, um, that votes are being um, counted correctly. It is, it is part of what makes our um, election so free and fair is that we do have that constant supervision to make sure that it's, it's all being done above board. Mm. And then why are scrutineers able to wear party regalia and rosettes in the polling booth when all advertising has, ceased, has to cease the day before? Yeah, that, that is another, another very good question. Um, so I think it is simply to identify them as scrutineers um, because they are allowed to sit in places that other people wouldn't be able to. Um, yeah, I think, again, it's just for transparency. Mm. Now... Are the two referenda for this election binding or non-binding? Who decides on whether they are or are not? Well, I can answer the first part of that, and the answer is yes. <laughs> one is binding and one is not. So the end-of-life referendum is binding, and I believe that is because that legislation has been completely written, so people know exactly what they are voting for or against. Um, the uh, cannabis referendum is not binding, um, and I believe for a similar reason in that the legislation is not completed, so people are not are not voting for a specific set of rules around it. It's more for the government to get an idea of, of whether there is public approval for going ahead with it. 
Mm. Yes, I, I think the, the bill is reasonably complete, but uh, I, I think there's uh, an issue around um, just further refinement to it. So the non-binding cannabis referendum is will allow Parliament to, to make some changes uh, if, if they have to, uh, following the result uh, of the referendum. Uh, in, in terms of who decides on whether they are or not, um, citizens initiated referenda are always non-binding. Uh, government initiated referenda can be binding, like the referenda on the electoral system that we had in the early 90s, uh, or, or, the, or they can be non-binding. Um, so it's generally the government of the day that decides whether they are binding or not. Oh, great. Thank you. Rachel, here's a question for you. Do you think the caretaker convention will still apply this year, given the circumstances? Uh, yes, I'm sure it will. And it'll be after the election again, as usual. Um, is that, that's a very short answer. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yes, I mean, as I say, um, BAU will still be continuing. So um, uh, after the election, um, and I think for anything significant, the same principles will apply that those sorts of things would either be uh, short term, deferred short term decisions or made in consultation with other parties. Mm. Yes, I'd agree with that. The, I mean, the caretaker convention is set out in the cabinet manual and the cabinet manual is, is really part of New Zealand's uh, constitution. Mm. Uh, and so constitutional matters are not optional. Uh, you know, we have to we have to apply them evenly and even handedly. So there will be a caretaker convention this year as well. And love hearing a plug for the Cabinet Manual, John. Um, the Cabinet Manual is available on the DPMC website and Chapter 6 is all about elections and government formation. So it's a great read. It is. I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> now, what happens if we go back into lockdown level 4 during the time that Parliament isn't sitting or dissolved? Is there emergency settings? And in turn, does that change any timelines for the election? Oh, uh, where is Ashley? Uh, where is where is where is Dr. Broomfield when we need him? Uh, oh, I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I think it's going to complicate the election, uh, definitely. Um, I think we're pretty keen on getting to the election date. So I think they're going to do everything they can to to keep that going. Uh, but I'm not too sure what I I can say beyond that. Okay. No, I don't think I have much to add either. We've we've been planning, all, all of our plans for delivering the election are based around being in alert level two or lower. So I'm unsure if, if from our side of things, how much we would be able to proceed with if we went back into lockdown. Mm. I guess the only other Sorry, right. Oh. Sorry, muted. I guess the only other thing I'd say is don't forget that um, the decisions around the alert levels were made under existing, um, you know, that, that there is legislation in place around emergencies mm. already. Mm. Now, for the referendums, what happens if we vote yes? I think Karen's. We sort of covered that in terms of binding and non-binding. So yeah. the end of choice life bill, uh, that's a binding one. So that legislation will come into force, uh, I guess. Uh, in terms of the cannabis one, if we vote yes, uh, although there's sort of a, a, a potential bill there, uh, changes to that bill can, uh, can still occur. But having said that, the political parties in government have... Um, committed themselves to honouring the intent of the referendum. So uh, although there may be changes to the bills, uh, effectively the referendum result would, would stand. Mm. Now, this may be a simple question, but do they still have actual specific sit seats that they sit in in Parliament according to the electorate or party? Not according to their electorate, but according to their party and according to their ranking within the party. Mm. So you'll notice that all the MPs of one particular party sit together. Uh, and then within that party grouping, uh, there are designated seats for the leader of the party, the deputy leader, uh, reflecting the, the cabinet rankings uh, and that sort of thing. So there are definitely definite seats in which they sit. 
Thanks, John. Now, can international students campaign for parties or candidates they support? That's a... Ooh, I believe so. Yeah. John? Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Um, I imagine so. It, it, uh, I think again they, they'll they'll be classified as a a third party, um, and and maybe uh, in terms of spending, they they might be limited mm. to how much um, time or or effort or resources they they put into it. It's, it's not just money uh, that's counted, um, but uh, depending on what. The question me questioner means by campaigning for parties. Uh, I don't think there's any necessary uh, restriction on them. Mm. Can one person campaign for more than one party or candidate? Um, I, as far as I know, yeah, that's seems a little good. counterproductive, but yeah. <laughs> Get in. Mm. Now, so guess, yeah, I'm not too sure where what that is. Where are we at with prisoners being able to vote? Do you guys know? Um, I believe that's still with still with Parliament. Mm. Is that right, John? Or I Rachel? believe so. I mean, there was a um, uh, a bill introduced to return. Uh, voting for prisoners, uh, at least for those who were in prison for less than three years. Uh, but I, I don't think that legislation has passed yet. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it might be one of those things that it does or, 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 or maybe doesn't get passed before the election. Okay. Well, given the time, we've run quite a bit over. So I think we're going to have to wrap up and any of the questions we haven't got to, um, our education team will get to them at a later date and we'll send out emails. Thank you all for being a part of this. Your um, expertise is invaluable and we really appreciate it. It's hard to fit all this information on elections into one hour and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Just uh, no worries. Just while the buildings of Parliament remain unopened to the public, we encourage you to check out our virtual tour through the Parliament XR app, which is available in both English and Te Reo Māori. And again, I'll explain that any questions we've missed, our education team will get to them. And any further questions you have about these webinars, please feel free to send them through to the education team um, email on the screen there or any more general questions about Parliament please send them to our library team as you can see on the screen there too. Thank you once again and ka kite, take care. Bye. <laughs> bye bye everyone.